Welcome back, everyone. My name is Mikey from Able Prep Academy, and we are back with our AP Biology videos. I apologize that we haven't been producing content for the last couple of months. With my kids being out of school and the flu season kicking off and college admission cycles coming up, it's been a little bit challenging, but we are back with more content now, starting today, where we're gonna be moving on to photosynthesis. So stay tuned. So whether you're taking AP Biology or just biology in general, I hope this channel will help you consolidate some of the information and make it a little bit easier for you to understand what's happening in school, particularly for photosynthesis, which is one of the more challenging concepts in biology. So today what I'm going to do is make the first part of a multi-series video that's going to go through each step of photosynthetic process, starting from the way that sunlight can act as an energy source, and then the light reaction, Calvin cycle, and everything else in our subsequent videos. So please stay tuned for those. And if you haven't already, click subscribe and press the like button so you can always come back and review the content at a later time. So today we're gonna to be talking about light and light as an energy source. Now remember, I'm not a theoretical physicist, so I'm not gonna be able to go into details about the whole wave particle duality of light and any of that crazy stuff. But what I can tell you are some bits of information that's going to make it a little bit easier for you to understand what's happening in the light reaction and everything that's gonna happen beyond this point all the way down to cell respiration. So let's talk about light in general. Now, first and foremost, you probably have heard of the idea that light travels like a wave, and that's true. It also behaves like a particle, and that's also true. But the wave part is a little bit more important for us because we need to understand how this wave of energy can propagate through the universe and interface with biological substances. But in order to understand this, I'm going to actually use an example with which you might be a little bit more familiar, which are earthquakes. Now, I used to live on the west coast of the United States, in Seattle, actually, so I've been through a couple of earthquakes myself. And if you've taken geology or earth sciences before, you would know that the earth is comprised of many tectonic plates, which are all moving past one another. And sometimes when they move past or against each other, energy can build up, and this tension, when it's released all at once, can propagate as earthquakes. Now, when an earthquake happens, we know that the energy moves through our planet, the rocks, through waves. And the waves we call P waves, S waves, and L waves, short for love waves, incidentally, it was my favorite one, although I don't know why, because that's the one that causes a lot of damage. But in any case, waves then travel from the focal point of that earthquake outwards and causes all of the movement and the damage to occur. And what's happening here is that we can then talk about the wave as a propagation of energy through the medium, and in this case, medium being our planet. And why is this important? Well, this is really important because if you think about what's actually happening to those rocks, the rocks themselves are not moving from point A to point B, but it's simply the movement of energy that's occurring in the shape of a wave. And much like that, the solar energy also travels through the universe as waves. However, here is one of the biggest challenges in understanding this concept, because the sun is at one point in our universe, and then there's our planet. And in between, we call this the vacuum of space. And in the vacuum of space, there's no matter, which means that unlike the earthquake, which had energy moving through the medium, which was our planet, there's no medium through which the waves can propagate. But Maybe there is, because here's the thing. We are massive substances, as in we are created from atoms that have mass, and as such, we tend to think of the world with a mass-centric point of view. However, there's this whole other part of the universe called fields. We have things like the gravitational fields, and we also have, of course, our electromagnetic field. In fact, what's really happening is that the sun produces a lot of energy through that nuclear fusion reaction. The energy is going to propagate as waves, not through a massive medium, but through the disturbance in the electromagnetic field as its medium. And as the electromagnetic field is disturbed, it eventually arrives on our planet at various wavelengths. Now, if you've all seen the electromagnetic radiation spectrum before, you would know that we have longer wavelengths like radio waves on one end, and of course, the very powerful short wavelengths waves such as the gamma ray radiation. However, what we're interested in is what we call the visible light spectrum, which lies somewhere in the middle between 380 nanometers and 780 nanometers in wavelengths. Now, when these particles of light that we call photon arrives on our planet, it has to then interface with the living realm, and that is where chlorophyll molecules are gonna come in. Because here's the thing, when electromagnetic radiation exists within that field, it 
has to then interface with something that is in fact massive. And these pigments, whether it be chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, all of these pigments have special qualities that allow them to interact with that energy in a physical sense. So here's what's gonna happen. If you take a look at the chlorophyll molecule, it's a porphyrin ring with a magnesium atom in the center, and it also has a little bit of a hydrocarbon chain, as we'll see later on, that plays an important role in its placement within the cell. However, the important thing is the magnesium atom, because if you remember looking at a magnesium atom in a Bohr diagram in, let's say, general chemistry, you would note that it has 12 electrons that are distributed across the three energy levels that it has, two in the first, eight in the second, and two in the third energy level. When light energy interfaces with this magnesium atom, it can then excite one of these electrons. So what does it mean for an electron to be excited? Well, it means that the electron will go from its ground state or where all of those electrons are in the lowest energy levels, and it will actually push them up to a high energy level, like let's say the fourth or the fifth or the sixth energy level. Now remember that these electrons don't really wanna be there because they're negatively charged. They want to be closer to the positively charged nucleus. So what you're actually doing with the light's energy is charging up this potential energy of the excited electron so that when it falls back down, you might be able to recuperate some of that energy to do some work, which is the primary focus of the light reaction. But focusing just on these electrons first, I always imagine this like a rubber band being pulled or stretched backwards because it has its ground state where it's resting and the excited state where the rubber band is pulled back. And when you let go of that rubber band, it returns to its normal state and it releases energy. And just like that, when these electrons get excited, they can drop back down to its ground state, thereby releasing energy. Now here's what happens to purified chlorophyll solutions in a beaker. When you shine light on it, the chlorophyll molecules will then excite those electrons to a higher energy level, but it will drop right away. And as it drops, it releases another photon with some residual heat, thereby resulting in a phenomena that we call fluorescence. And the fluorescence of chlorophyll molecules tend to be magenta. But the funny thing is, even though the book, and that is the Campbell Biology, likes to show you this picture of fluorescence, this, I can say, is the last thing that plants want to do. Why? Because plants want to make use of that excited electron's energy, not to just simply let it drop and have another photon being released at the same time. It really does no good for the plant to simply release the energy that it has just absorbed. So then what we have to understand is that chlorophylls do not exist in isolation within the cell. In fact, I'm going to introduce you guys to a very complex protein called a photosystem. And we're gonna see two of these in the light reaction in the next video. But in the photosystem, we have a network of these chlorophyll molecules in such a way that when an electron gets excited, instead of having it drop right back down to its ground state releasing fluorescence, it's going to actually pass those electrons on from one antennae chlorophyll to the other, to another, to another, in that series of reduction events so that we get that electron ready to do the work that the plants need to do in order to make the energy available for the biological system in order to eventually create glucose. So hopefully that will set the stage for what's gonna happen in the light reaction. However, I do wanna mention a couple of additional things that you might want to know. First, you need to know what an absorption spectrum and an action spectrum is. The absorption spectrum is simply a graph that shows the amount of energy that can be absorbed by a pigment as a function of the wavelength of light that's coming in. And as you can see from this image, yes, chlorophyll A and B has the capacity to absorb wavelengths of light in the blue and the red ends of the spectrum with carotenoids helping out as well. However, the action spectrum here is slightly different because the axis for the action spectrum, specifically on the Y axis, is going to show the rate of photosynthesis. So the main difference that you have to understand between the absorption spectrum and the action spectrum is that the absorption spectrum is simply a chemical phenomenon whereby I can simply purify chlorophyll molecules, put them in a test tube, and still create this type of graph using a spectrophotometer. However, an action spectrum can only be calculated based on a biological phenomenon whereby we have to measure the rate of photosynthesis by typically measuring things like oxygen production by the plant. So the main difference is whether it's a chemically based experiment through which we obtain the data or a biological experiment through which we obtain the data. And for some reason, College Board really wants you to understand the difference, so it's really useful to know that. So that is all for this video, but in the next video, we're gonna move right along to the light reaction, starting with the gross anatomy of the plant. So make sure you click subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out when we release that video, hopefully very soon. 
Have a great day.